Uh, kia ora tato. Um, ko Rob Scolle, taka ingoa. My name is Rob Scolle. I am have the polite title of honorary academic at the University of Auckland, which you could say was sort of means I've been put out to pasture, but every now and then I come back into the fold and uh, have a role to play, which I'm doing today. I'm also the vice chair of the New Zealand Committee of the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council. The Pacific Cooperation Council is a non a regional non-governmental organisation that has over many years provided, seen itself as providing support um, to APEC, the APEC process of uh, uh, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. The, the PECC uh, acts as a sounding board and maybe a think tank sometimes for the APEC process. Um, so uh, that's that's been a role that has gone on for many many years now. Um, I'm privileged to uh, facilitate this very very distinguished panel. Um, three of three of the panelists are here today, and the other one will be zooming in from Siva Fiji. Um, I'll just very briefly introduce our panelists. Um, they are going to uh, sort of react from their perspectives to the panorama. From, that we were provided in the first two panel, panels of uh, what is happening out there in the world, what has happened, and I guess the big question that uh, um, was raised and, and uh, hopefully our panellists will provide some answers to is where to next. Um, so just briefly to introduce, uh, Justine Arrell um, is the, represents, if you like, the ongoing powerhouse of New Zealand's international trade, Fonterra. Um, General Manager of Trade there, she has a long history of working for foreign affairs and trade, including at some of the major posts around the world of uh, Washington and London, and I think also Brussels, if I'm not mistaken. Well, not Brussels, okay. I can't name that. Um, so she will speak first, and uh, followed by Peter Hunter, who is a distinguished professor um, at the University of Auckland, a founder of the Auckland Bioengineering Bio Bioengineering Institute, and as a enormously impressive uh, history of work in many top universities around the world on uh, science and technology in in um, issues. So he can provide the, if you like, the scientific perspective on where New Zealand should be heading in relation to, um, to the issues that we're facing. And then from the academic perspective, Natasha Hamilton Hart, Professor Natasha, Natasha Hamilton Hart from the Department of Management and International Business at the University of Auckland. Um, also the director of the New Zealand Asia Institute at the University of Auckland and I would say without any question the leading academic expert in New Zealand on the economies and, uh, uh, of, uh, and trade of the um, East Asian economies. And then finally beaming in from Suva Fiji we will have the director of policy at the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat to provide a perspective that often perhaps we don't pay enough attention to that is the priorities in this global economic situation of the Pacific, our Pacific Island partners and their expectations from New Zealand as one of their um, long-time traditional partners in, in, this, in these endeavours. So without any further ado, I will um, invite Justine to present the, make the first presentation. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa, namahi nui ki akwe. Thank you, Rob, for your um, kind words of introduction. Um, so I think today we've been asked to talk a little bit about some of the new opportunities, the new challenges, or, or whether it's really just business as usual um, against the backdrop of today's theme around um, leading trade agreements for sustainable futures. And I guess from a Fonterra perspective, the real reality is that, um, you know, all of us as exporters are grappling with um, a, a range of new issues and challenges, whether that's, you know, some of the topics you heard this morning around increasing geopolitical uncertainty, um, increasing supply chain disruption, you know, ongoing issues around um, the inflationary impacts on businesses. You know, those are all challenges that we're, that we're grappling with as business. But there are also really significant opportunities and I'll talk a little bit about those in, in more detail. Um, some of these are very similar to, to what we've seen in the past and, and others are, are new. And so for you as policymakers, I think that makes for a really exciting, dynamic and, and complex world um, and a, really an exciting time to be working in trade. Um, I thought just to elaborate on Rob's introduction around Fonterra, it's useful just to give you a bit of context around who we are as, a, as an exporter. 
Um, so we're a, a New Zealand-owned dairy cooperative owned by 8,300 farmers. Um, we export 95% of everything that we produce to around 120 markets globally. Um, and we account in total for around, <coughs> excuse me, 25% of New Zealand's goods exports. Um, so it kind of goes without saying that, you know, trade is really existential for the success of our business. Um, and that probably goes without saying, but I think given the audience here today, it's, it's really useful to underscore the importance and the value of the work that you do every day, um, you know, whether you're a policymaker or working um, kind of more broadly as a trade policy practitioner. And there are kind of a range of different areas where trade policy really matters to exporters like us, you know, whether that's establishing legally enforceable global trade rules, um, improving access to high value markets through free trade agreements and through the WTO, enhancing strong relationships with key bilateral trading partners and addressing non-tariff barriers as these arise, um, and also supporting exporters to navigate new and emerging issues that, that impact on our ability to trade. So when I think about what is new or newer in trade, um, you know, and I look back over the last few years, and we've really seen the evolution of trade policy move away from purely a focus of economic efficiency and the free flow of goods and services as its primary objective. You know, as trade evolves, so do, do trade rules. Um, and we've also seen policymakers, you know, quite rightly asking how trade rules can, can support a much broader range of policy objectives. You know, and ensure that the benefits of trade are, are equitable and inclusive. And I think there's also a key question around how do we ensure that trade maintains its social license to operate, because you know, that's something I think we've learnt that we, we really can't take for granted even here in New Zealand. Um, and these are really kind of fundamental issues and, and priorities for New Zealand and for, for exporters um, like Fonterra. You know, if I look at issues like climate change and sustainability, I think as you heard from, from the panel this morning, you know, these are critical issues for, for our business. Um, you know, whether that's from sort of an adaptation or a mitigation perspective, we're all looking at ways that we can support the transition to, to net zero. And our customers are demanding this from us and our consumers in, in global export markets. You know, and it extends well beyond issues around climate change to things like animal well-being, um, you know, reducing single-use plastics, um, and we need to ensure that the policies, including trade policy, um, continue to support outcomes, you know, that they're science and evidence-backed, um, and that they don't, you know, inadvertently become a barrier to trade, um, which is something that we, we, we see as, as a risk. If we look at issues around supply chain resilience, which have become extremely topical, I think particularly during the COVID-19 period, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're a, a goods exporter exporting 95% of everything that we produce here in New Zealand to markets, 120 markets around the world, um, operating really complicated supply chains in a really increasingly um, uncertain world. So it's been really positive and really important, we think, that you know, governments like here in New Zealand um, and in the markets in which we operate are investing um, and thinking carefully about what domestic infrastructure is required to support um, an export-led economy. Um, and, you know, pleasing to see um, agreements like IPF looking at how to reduce those, um, you know, that supply chain risk. If we look at ensuring the benefits of trade are equitably distributed, you know, particularly across SMEs, um, you know, women um, and uh, Māori businesses, you know, I think for Fonterra, we, you know, we're probably, it's probably a bit rich for us to, to claim any sort of SME status, but, you know, when I think about our farmer shareholder base, those 8,300 farmers, you know, they are all generally family-owned businesses, you know, grappling with the same issues that, that small to medium-sized enterprises are grappling with across New Zealand, you know, whether it's managing budgets, profit and loss, HR and staffing issues. Um, and given our, our global and regional footprint here in New Zealand, we have a, a hugely diverse um, employee base, and our Māori shareholders and suppliers are active participants in, in the Māori economy. And if we look at, at digital trade, you know, hat tip to, um, to Steph Honey, you know, in an increasingly globally and, and digitally connected world, you know, issues like the ability of data to freely flow across borders, um, moving to paperless trade, issues around privacy, um, you know, it's really important that these issues are, are considered, whether it's in the DEPA or in CPTPP. You know, for us as a business, it's, um, it's not widely known, but we're a, we have a major stake in the world's largest global dairy trade platform. Um, and we increasingly lose, use digital tools to, to engage with our customers. So these issues are, are really relevant, even if at first blush it, it might seem that we're more focused on the good side, which are obviously also critically important. 
So we, we really want to see New Zealand's interests in these areas progressed, you know, whether this is through FTAs, um, through domestic policy development, or of course the, the kind of the critical engagement with a, a variety of stakeholders that, that underpins all of those. So I've sort of touched a little bit on, on what are the kind of the sort of the newer issues um, that are coming to the fore as, as, as part of um, New Zealand and, and global trade policy really. Um, but it's also important to, to kind of think about what, what hasn't changed and what remains the same. Um, you know, certainly from a, a dairy perspective, um, you know, a number of the, the challenges are really around global tr dairy trade distortions, um, and many of those, unfortunately, haven't, have not yet been resolved. So it's not through a lack of determination, um, you know, the willingness of successive New Zealand governments or New Zealand's world-class um, trade negotiators, but, but rather it really just reflects the ongoing protectionism that afflicts agricultural trade globally. Um, you know, we heard from, from Van Gallis earlier, you know, the, the, the level of subsidisation that, that continues in, in key markets. You know, for dairy, um, you know, we still face really high tariffs in a number of our key markets. Um, so, you know, really important that, that trade policy continues to look at, at what are the, the new and emerging issues that are important from a trade policy perspective, but that we don't forget um, the unfinished business um, that has historically afflicted the, you know, a number of New Zealand exporters. And I think we can look at, at some of the benefits as well that um, you know, high quality trade agreements, particularly into Asian markets, um, have underpinned the historic export success of, of the New Zealand dairy industry and other agricultural exporters um, in some of our key export markets. Um, you know, these, and these FTAs have in turn um, provided really significant returns back into the wider New Zealand um, economy, particularly in rural New Zealand, um, you know, in those sectors that are engaged in the wider dairy farming and, and processing sectors. Um, you know, one of the, um, you know, stats I think we heard earlier today was that, you know, 73% of New Zealand's trade is now covered by existing FTAs. You know, that's a real milestone and, and one I think that we should be collectively proud of. You know, for us, nine out of our ten top trading partners are New Zealand FTA partners. And there's, there's, that's not a coincidence, you know. Certainly those trade agreements have underpinned our success in those markets. Um, but despite this um, success, you know, the, the challenge for us is that we still continue to face, you know, very high tariffs in, in key markets, you know, and subject to, to subsidies, non-tariff barriers and other distortions for, for global dairy trade. So we estimate even despite the success and the, and the progress that's been made to date, we still only have access to around 12% of global dairy consumption at tariffs of less than 10%. So when you think about global dairy consumption and the opportunity for us as, as a, you know, an exporter of high quality, sustainably produced dairy nutrition, you know, there's a very small proportion of, of total global um, consumption that we have, you know, access to. Um, and a recent, you, you might have read the, the de recent DCANS Dairy NZ um, report that found with even with a high, you know, percentage of New Zealand's trade covered by these agreements, New Zealand dairy exporters today are still continuing to pay around a billion dollars um, in tariffs and over seven billion dollars in non-tariff measures. So I think from our perspective that really underscores the, the work that's still, that's still yet to be done. Um, so Rob, I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I, I guess just in terms of, you know, leaving a, a final note and kind of where does that leave us today, you know, I think the, the kind of the plethora of, of new and existing challenges that are facing exporters, you know, are all, all really significant and I think that the group that we have here today have a really important role to, to play in helping us address those. Um, and certainly I think, you know, HUI, like the, the Trade and Economic Policy School, is a really important vehicle for, for continuing those discussions. So really looking forward to the conversation with fellow panellists to follow. Thanks. Yes. Thank you very much, Justine, for a very succinct um, presentation. Um, I'll move now to Professor Peter Hunter, who uh, perhaps uh, represents what may be perhaps one of the shining stars of the future for the New Zealand economy, the Science and Technology Centre and the contribution that we can expect from science and technology uh, in general to the um, meeting of the challenges that we're facing. Oh, sorry. Okay. I hope you heard that. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you, Rob. Um, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto katoa, uh, Kopita Hunter, Toko Noa. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context for why I'm here, I've recently stepped down as the 
director of the Auckland Bioengineering Institute, or ABI, which is one of two large-scale research institutes at the University of Auckland. Um, we have about 300 people in the institute, about half are students, um, PhD, masters students, half are academic and professional staff, and many of them teach within various departments, faculties around the university, but they, they do their research within the LSRI. So we're a, a research-only institute, um, and we're focused very much on translational, doing basic science, but also translating into commercial outcomes, um, mainly because the work we do, which is primarily in two major areas, computational physiology, which is about using maths and physics to understand biological processes and build models of the human body. And then the other area is instrumentation development and med tech. So that's about developing devices for measuring, for doing home-based, implantable, wearable, et cetera, devices, or using hospital um, imaging equipment, for example, to feed data into those models for helping with healthcare processes. And the only way that you get research outcomes into into practice from in this area is by creating spin-out companies that then take these um, processes or products to worldwide markets. So we've done about 25 companies over the last 10, 15 years. Um, 10 of them, I would say, are really growing rapidly. We've got FDA approval for various um, devices or processes. They all, right from the start, have an international market. Uh, no one starts creating a company that's only addressing New Zealand. They're all, from day one, addressing international markets. They typically move into the US first, then into um, Europe and Asia, but uh, it's, generally, it's, it's generally both establishing clinical relevance within New Zealand, but also um, working closely with US markets. Um, and the other thing that we're doing, the ABI is doing, and I'm helping to lead, is the idea of creating what we call a medtech innovation quarter, which is about <clears throat> bringing together everyone in New Zealand who's involved in medtech, so all four major centres and all the universities that are involved are now behind a single initiative which is trying to establish an ecosystem in New Zealand for um, commercial translation of research opportunities, medtech innovation quarter, medtech IQ, and that is building bridges particularly with Australia at the moment, but also with the US and Europe. And one of the um, <clears throat> really important initiatives that MB have taken is this um, link up with Horizon Europe, which gives us access to pillar two of Horizon Europe. And I, I think that's really one of the most important science moves that this country has taken for quite some time, because it, it not only gives us access to large-scale research funds in Europe, but it opens up all the potential collaborations, both for scientific research, but also for the commercial companies that we spin out. Um, and all of science these days is international. You don't do any <coughs> science without collaborating with people around the globe. And I think the, what the Horizon Europe Pillar 2 um, initiative does now is to put us back where we were. I had, I used to have Horizon, or the predecessor of Horizon, Framework 7, for example, grants many years ago. Um, and now we're back in a position where we can work with many European partners, both at a research level, but also looking for um, commercial opportunities that come out of that research as joint ventures between New Zealand and, and European scientists. So I'm extremely um, positive about the opportunities for us as part of Horizon Europe. And the specific, I got one of the <coughs> two Horizon Europe grants that was awarded to New Zealand in the first round where we could bid. So one of those is I, I teamed up with a group in Belgium um, and it's, a, it's about a $20 million um, grant of which New Zealand will only get about 10%, but the real value is the international linkages that that um, brings and the opportunities for students to work both here and in Europe and vice versa for European students. And the particular focus of that grant is around what we call a digital human twin. So that is building models of the body coupled with measurement devices that can be used for healthcare by 
tracking the physiological state of individuals. So very much trying to do what has happened in many other aspects of engineering technologies where you have digital twins for many, many um, engineering devices which are constantly updated with continuous measurement of performance of those devices. So we're trying to do the same thing for humans and trying to see if that can have an impact on healthcare. And that's something that Europe is very interested in and the US, of course. So it's got to be a global effort. And New Zealand being part of that global effort opens up opportunities for our companies to take advantage of our engagement, uh, global engagement with those uh, technologies. So, thank you. Thank you very much for a fascinating insight into a dimension. A fascinating insight into a dimension of New Zealand's external relationships that I'm pretty sure many of us have had very little contact with. I mean, that was really quite eye-opening. Thank you. Um, can I move now to Professor Natasha Hamilton Hart to provide her perspective on the challenges that we face, possibly from a geopolitical perspective as well as uh, the international business perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you to the organisers. Uh, I want to actually start with the business as usual, which is um, actually to take us down into the national level uh, structure of interests, interest groups, preferences, politics and institutions. And that is because international trade, of course, you know, happens cross-nationally, but it's often uh, referred to um, as a two-level game. And as trade diplomats in your sort of daily life, you're involved in the international dimension of that two-level game, the international level, country to country, government to government. But it is also inevitably, and in all countries, a domestic political game. And so the domestic political economy of who are the players, what coalitions have they formed? What do they want? What do the institutional context allow them to do? Um, and that there is no shortcut for understanding that except to go country by country. Uh, because you might be able to generalize in a few cases, but typically the coalition of interests and what they want and what deal they're prepared to offer will be anchored in the domestic political economy of each country. And this is particularly important now that we, the, you know, we have passed, as several speakers have said today, the era of trade agreements that are primarily focused around at-the-border tariff cuts. Um, there are still at-the-border barriers, that's for sure, but in many ways trade agreements uh, these days, as I've heard Rob Scolle say on many occasions, they're really around Regulation. I mean, you, you could, if you interpret the word regulation flexibly, you could say they're all regulatory agreements. They're around what will the standards be in this area? What are the ones for disclosure, for carbon pricing, for um, for pollution, for food safety, uh, for subsidies, for state aid? You know, in to a certain extent, these are all regulatory issues, and because of that, they go to the heart of domestic political economy conflicts. Um, every regulation, whether it's a good one or a bad one, will generate winners and losers. And that is why they are typically very contentious, because um, even if, from a private sector standpoint, um, particularly if you're a sort of price taker in world markets like most New Zealand firms, and you just go, well, actually, the regulatory complexity and fragmentation creates compliant costs, because we have to do it differently. We have to, you know, label things differently. We need different procedures, we need to document things differently. All of this creates a significant amount of market friction. So many private sector players will be happy to say, well, it almost doesn't matter what the standard is, because if, if, it's, if there's mutual recognition or if there is some degree of harmonization, we can produce more efficiently. But for the larger markets in particular, it really is always going to matter which particular standard wins out, because that will enable particular interests to have a comparative advantage. So the, the business as usual part is that we haven't got away from politics. In fact, it has come increasingly to the fore. Um, and this is why the headline agreements in the preferential trade agreements and other kinds of agreements, um, they matter for sure, but the implementation can be hugely variable. 
And just to give one example around China's commitments in the WTO, when China joined the WTO 2001, it made a whole lot of commitments that actually involved really significant shifts at the domestic level uh, that would go to the heart of its developmental model and its national institutions. Um, you know, things like competition commissions, uh, intellectual property agencies, uh, food safety standards setting agencies, um, all of these required significant institutional change on the part of different levels of Chinese government. And what is really interesting, and I'm drawing on the work of a, a, a Chinese um, scholar who's based in the United States, uh, Tanya Ling, is that she, through looking at, with the assistance of machine learning, thousands and thousands of pages of regulations and regulatory decisions in China, um, looking at how they have implemented their WTO commitments and the downstream institutional changes that they needed to make, she found two major things to simplify. One is that there actually has been really huge institutional change in China in many of those areas where China just didn't have an agency or it operated according to completely different principles. These have now changed in many significant ways. But the other thing that she showed very clearly was that the implementation was uneven across different levels of government, um, both at the provincial and at the local level, and that this was really being driven by the particular constellation of interests and political incentives that embed themselves both through the Communist Party and the local industry uh, to determine whether or not it was actually worth their while adapting to these new standards or whether, in fact, all of their interests and rewards were more closely aligned to ongoing uh, practices that we would call developmental state or directive protectionist kind of policies. And that if you want to understand the pattern of implementation in China, you therefore need to pay a lot of attention to what is happening, not just at the national level, but also how this filters out at different levels of government. Another example that is, you know, so, so I think Zespri is one of our test cases in China for how this might play out in the intellectual property protection space. Uh, because Chinese IP laws and institutions and the court infrastructure have in fact changed enormously um, in part as a result of China joining the WTO and signing up to some of the TRIPS agreement and then other agreements that it's made since then. But as, you know, 50,000 hectares of unlicensed planting and growing in different parts of provincial China shows, it's not enough just to change the law. You actually need to look at how this um, might ever get implemented on the ground, and at that point, you're going to be confronting local interests whose, in whose incentives are very different. Another example that um, many of you in the room are probably familiar with to some extent is the New Zealand-Indonesia um, beef dispute where New Zealand has taken Indonesia uh, to the WTO dispute resolution uh, panel to get a ruling which New Zealand won that um, Indonesia was placing unwarranted restrictions on New Zealand's beef. Uh, New Zealand won, it won again on appeal. Uh, and, and it's quite interesting because the there is a certain, what looks from the outside like schizophrenia on the part of the Indonesian authorities, because at one level they say, yes, we're fully committed to implementing the WTO rulings, and we definitely don't want to just ignore the WTO and our commitments there. But on the other hand, Indonesia also has a long-standing and deeply embedded food self-sufficiency policy uh, that can go back to the earliest days of um, Indonesia's independence um, in, the in the 1940s, uh, that it mixes up food self-sufficiency, food sovereignty, and food security in contradictory and baffling ways, but it's not going away. And that means, um, I mean, we can watch this space evolve, but we can expect the regulatory environment for New Zealand beef exporters, my money would be that it will still be very different, difficult, because there will be a new set of regulations and these will be opaque and these will be changeable. And they are going to present effect on effect for New Zealand beef exporters regardless of the win at the WTO. Um, so where does this take us in terms of opportunities going forward? And I really so grateful to the first panel today for having uh, laid the ground because um, I can pick up where they left off. Um, 
So for regulators, I think one of the going forward opportunities is, is uh, you know, Sarah Salmon's point that we might have reached the end of the line with traditional trade agreements. Um, but what will be very, very important are ongoing and intensified regulator to regulator contacts. Uh, because that kind of cooperation isn't necessarily aimed at securing regulatory harmonization. That may just not be feasible. But nonetheless, the more that you can build credibility uh, with your counterparts overseas, you know, the personal connections, the institutional credibility, the respect for the standards that we have, and the assurances that, you know, when MPI says, we've audited, we've provided this assurance around safety, this makes a huge difference on the ground. Um, so getting, getting the, not just foreign affairs officials, but MPI, MB, specific regulatory authorities, uh, in regular, and you know, you can't just do it once, <laughs> continuous sort of contact with their counterparts overseas. Um, I think that will be key to opening up the commercial opportunity that, that must exist. Um, for businesses, I think it's also about being part of those winning, winning coalitions in the markets where you want to go into. Um, and I think actually Peter Hunter's presentation just now gave us a, a fascinating example of, um, you know, if you can be part of an emerging landscape of research development and uh, commercialization overseas, then you're in on the ground and you have allies and you're not fighting on the door to try and get, get let in. Um, you're already there. Um, and I think that that is going to be increasingly important as supply chains are continuously being remade, um, which gives us the opportunity to get in involved closer to the ground, but it also means that if we miss that opportunity, we do risk seeing them close off against us. Um, so let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm sure that will have been an eye-opening presentation for um, our future trade policy officials in the, in the audience. Thank you. And I think you also highlighted a, a, an aspect of trade agreements that perhaps have been underestimated so far, that a, a while um, the reduction of formal trade barriers may have come to a fairly um, difficult uh, stage. Um, there's also the role of trade agreements in providing a vehicle or a forum for relationship building and relationship maintenance. And those that, that function of trade agreements, I think, really is extremely important, as you've emphasised, and it may be even more important with some of the challenges that we might face in 2024, which we don't like to think about, but they may come to pass. Um, OK, so finally, um, uh, our final speaker is uh, addressing us from Suva Fiji, from the uh, Pacific Island Forum Secretariat, uh, Joel Nilon, who is the um, director, uh, acting director for policy at the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat. He's going to speak to us, first of all, about the um, Pacific, Pacific Island Forum's flagship policy, the um, Blue Pacific 2050, and its um, implementation plan, which was approved by the leaders at the recent uh, forum, forum meeting, uh, but in doing so he will highlight, I think, the priorities that are reflected in that, uh, that um, plan uh, of our Pacific Island partners and also their expectations of New Zealand um, in, in, in the implementation of that plan as one of the main development partners of the Pacific, of the Pacific Islands. Um, over to you, Joel. Uh, yeah. Ula Minako, good morning uh, from uh, Stephen Fiji and also to thank the uh, organisers for the uh, wonderful opportunity to uh, be part of this uh, eclectic uh, panel. Um, and as, uh, as, as Rob has mentioned, um, just speak a little bit about the expectations for, for trade uh, coming out of the Pacific, especially through the prism of what is called the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific continent. Uh, and I also do want to, uh, as speakers before me have touched upon, um, you know, doing so, doing this in the context of a business as usual uh, environment um, or otherwise. <clears throat> uh, firstly, just by way of context, uh, just to also uh, reintroduce uh, myself, um, I'm the Acting Director of Policy at the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, uh, based uh, here in Suma, BG. Uh, the Pacific Islands Forum is the Pacific region's political, 
uh, and trade and economic organization. It meets every year at heads of government or leaders level, uh, and also at ministerial level. And so Pacific Islands foreign uh, economic, uh, trade, and also foreign ministers meet uh, annually uh, to discuss issues related to their uh, specific agreements. Uh, Pacific Islands Forum has 18 member countries, and of course New Zealand was a founding member when the organization was established uh, in 1971. Uh, so the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent was adopted by uh, leaders uh, of the Pacific Islands Forum last year, in 2022, as a long-term strategy, a long-term approach to uh, guide uh, the countries of the Pacific region, the areas where and how they can work together collectively uh, to deliver a tangible, positive development for our countries uh, and also for our region. In a nutshell, the 2050 strategy frames our ambition and our desire to develop and to transform collectively and to achieve, of course, the quality of life and the standard of living that we uh, each desire and expect, while also responding to our enduring and most urgent challenges, the foremost of which is the impacts and the causes of climate change. The 2050 strategy reflects our broad political and policy priorities through seven thematic areas, uh, which include political leadership and regionalism, people-centered development, peace and security, climate change and disaster risk management, uh, the ocean and the environment, resource and economic development, and also uh, technology and connectivity. Uh, the strategy itself was adopted by leaders uh, last year, but uh, a bit over a week ago, uh, in the Cook Islands, leaders also endorsed uh, its implementation plan, which uh, sets out near-term outcomes, uh, targets, and also specific regional actions uh, that our member countries will take collectively to deliver on their longer-run uh, ambitions. And the initial time frame for this implementation plan will be out uh, to 2030. Uh, to say at this stage that the development of both the 2050 strategy and its implementation plan was a widely consultative process, very much driven by member countries. And I think at this stage, we should really acknowledge uh, New Zealand's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade for contributing significantly to the development of these pieces of work uh, since 2019 when the work really began. So I think just to say that there is a degree of political and regional uh, significance attached to the 2050 strategy and, of course, its successful and effective implementation. And of course, critical uh, to this is the role in the place of economic development and, of course, trade uh, of goods and services to ensure that our businesses continue to operate and our peoples continue to have jobs and that our economies continue to, uh, to run. And I think just for some context, and perhaps as many uh, of you in the room would know, many of our countries across the Pacific feature uh, demographic and resource and economic settings and factors that um, in many cases have limited our ability to, tr to trade uh, competitively uh, with one another and also with the outside world. Although there have been some success uh, areas uh, in terms of sort of trade and agricultural products and commodities, particularly in terms of our fishery, as well as uh, in tourism and trade and some services um, as well. But although there is incredible diversity uh, across our member countries and our economies, we are relatively small uh, economies, we have relatively small populations and workforces, we are far from metropolitan markets, and trade is often difficult and expensive. And that's even on top of supply chain challenges that have been imposed particularly during uh, COVID-19. And I guess to tie into the theme of this panel, uh, through the 2050 strategy, through its implementation plan, uh, we can and we are certainly trying to return to business as usual from an economic and from a trade perspective. Of course, we need to keep our economies running, we need to keep businesses uh, taking over our people employed, as mandated by foreign trade ministers who met in October of this year and through our Pacific Aid for Trade strategy, and through existing and emergent sectors such as TARP, uh, 
We are continuing the path and the trajectory that we have been on for a number of years now. And quality infrastructure, aid for trade, even continuing to establish enabling business environments are all key to maintaining our, our business as usual approach to trade. In addition, and at present, many of our Pacific business, businesses are making the most of existing trade arrangements uh, within the region, such as the Pacific Islands Countries Trade Agreement, and also PESA Plus, as well as our countries own bilateral agreements with their trading partners. I guess in addition to this, and as many of you uh, would know, labor mobility, particularly the movement and mobility of our unskilled, semi-skilled, and also skilled workers to take up positions in Australia uh, and New Zealand, currently a hugely topical issue at present, both for the benefits that are accruing to the employees and to sending countries, but also because of some of the challenges that are being felt uh, as well. So these all sort of signal that we are very much maintaining or returning to business as usual as we look to take the first steps to deliver on the 2050 strategy and its implementation plan. Uh, of course, another part of our approach under the 2050 strategy is also to look beyond our business as usual. I guess this is just a note that a core uh, intention and a core thrust of the 2050 strategy uh, relates to transformation uh, and change uh, and keeping an eye on not just the short term, but also the medium and long term future. It's really about recognizing that we will need to not only maintain BAU, but simultaneously put in place the seeds of change and transformation uh, now. And for us, part of the opportunity for change uh, and transforma transformation uh, lies in the title of the strategy, 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent. Uh, this, continent, this concept of the Blue Pacific Continent, or Oana Nuiakiwa, as I believe you say in Aotearoa, recognizes for starters that our ocean continent consists of almost one third of the planet's surface, with countries that have significant exclusive economic zones, replete with marine resources, biodiversity, ecosystem, and renewable energy opportunity, critical minerals, and of course, a range of other resources. We continue to retain significant healthy tuna stocks. We are yet to fully explore or realize many of the biogenetic and other biodiversity resources in our ocean. We've yet to harness the renewable energy potential uh, of our ocean. There is also untapped potential in leveraging the carbon sequestration and other ecosystem and environmental services that our region provides to the world. There's also significant cultural heritage and traditional knowledge, uh, assets and managing and maintaining these, but also benefiting economically from these is another untapped and under-focused area of potential uh, for the Pacific. These opportunities are also coupled with our recognition and our understanding of the current heightened geopolitical interest and attention and focus that has been relentlessly trained on the Pacific the best part of a decade now. We know that our region is a critical strategic geographic part of the world, and we know that in many cases, the oceanic resource base that we steward and possess collectively is also of significant interest. Uh, the key for us is, of course, leveraging this attention, this interest for positive and beneficial trading opportunities and arrangements as we move into the future. It was encouraging to hear a number of our traditional partners, such as the US and China and Japan and Korea and the UK and the European Union, uh, and even newcomers like Saudi Arabia and Portugal and the United Arab Emirates all speak uh, to their political and policy support for the Pacific region at the recent forum leaders meeting in the Cook Islands. We need to leverage this interest and this opportunity into tangible and sustain trading relationships and opportunities in the years uh, to come. We need to extend and expand what we call the Pacific Trade and Invest Network, which my colleague Lennis Miller, uh, who is in the, in the room there with you, heads up the uh, New Zealand office. Uh, we need to expand this network into Korea and the US and other markets to give our businesses the opportunities to expand to these economies uh, into the future. 
So while we maintain our current path and trajectory in terms of existing sort of basis of trade and arrangements, of course the opportunities and the potential transformation also exist. And through the 2050 strategy as an overarching policy framework, we are really trying to bring some, uh, I guess, some conceptual approach, some planning, regional coordination in the areas of trade and, and of course, other areas uh, together. Uh, so Rob and, uh, and colleagues, really, to summarize uh, this short presentation, the 2050 strategy frames our approach to working together as a region, including through trade. It is by necessity that we maintain a business as usual approach and, of course, an incremental approach but we must also take a transformation-oriented approach moving forward. This will no doubt require political and policy ambition or a political group, grouping and block, such as the Pacific Islands Forum, and it will require unity of will and purpose, as well as political solidarity and vision uh, as well. For years, uh, for decades, many of our countries have been able to sort of survive under the status quo uh, global sort of ODA has supplemented our existing economic activity and performance, but uh, given the current global trends that we'll discuss in the first and second sessions this morning, it's important that we as the Pacific look to take a, a strategic and long-term approach to securing our future, and that of course starts with how we consider and how we look at trade uh, now and of course into the future. Uh, thank you, and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks to all the, the speakers for a very interesting set of comments. Um, this is a question for Natasha. Um, knowing that, uh, as, as you said, you know, there's, there's nothing that uh, can replace essentially going to markets and, and understanding the political and sort of commercial landscape there, and the challenges that I guess New Zealand regulators have in sort of building those dialogues with regulators in other markets. Um, what do you see as the, the sort of future for small businesses that don't have a lot of bandwidth to do that, that hard and costly work themselves? Thanks. So this is a really good question because uh, size matters and uh, companies that do not have the human resource to invest on the ground are obviously going to find it much harder. Um, what I think SMEs can do um, and ways in which the sort of broader NZ Inc. environment can help them is, uh, and this will it will vary according to product and, and market of course, but both New Zealand and other countries um, that we could sort of learn a bit from, such as Singapore, have had some successes in establishing, with varying degrees of sort of scale and formality, what you can think of as versions of industrial parks overseas. Um, and these don't necessarily need to be a physical industrial park with a gate on it. Um, but they can be vehicles for SMEs to piggyback on the experience and infrastructure and contacts and knowledge of other players. Um, and, you know, so well, my board member, Mitchell Pham, has led an initiative in Vietnam where um, he runs a software company, but they also provide facilities for other New Zealand tech firms to access some of the talent that's available in Vietnam without every firm having to sort of become experts in Vietnam. Um, and Singapore has a long track record of doing this on a much grander scale, of course. But I think that what, what SMEs need to be doing and what the public sector needs to do to support them, but this is also a role for business associations, is to think about how they connect to um, generate some of those economies of scale that SMEs inevitably lack. Yeah. Kia ora, my name is Victoria, I work for MFAT. Um, my question is also for Natasha. Um, Natasha, you mentioned in your speech about how um, regulator to regulator cooperation and getting mutual recognition can be helpful for addressing really difficult trade barriers. Are there any other creative strategies that you think could be helpful for getting progress on some of those issues that are really hard to otherwise address? I mean, this is a bit of a cheat answer, but, you know, the regulatory agencies are not necessarily just 
the formal regulator. Um, and that if you look on, and again, in any particular country, there will be a, a sort of coalition of players that are involved in determining what, not just what the on-paper regulation is, but how it's actually implemented. Um, and I think that, you know, to some extent, this is stuff that commercial actors need to do for themselves in terms of finding their, their allies and partners overseas. Um, but I think that to the extent that you can identify who the key decision makers are, um, that you can develop relationships with them, and these are not necessarily core regulatory agencies, but might be agencies that have a role in implementing um, decisions on the ground. Uh, and one, of, one of my favorite examples, and apologies to anyone who's heard it before, is um, we did a case study on Zephyr Cider, who's a small um, exporting company, but they, you know, many of you will know their product from its in supermarkets across New Zealand, and they export to um, China, and they got, you know, approval and access and so on. Uh, but in the early days, um, they had a shipload of, you know, uh, of their product cider, which is perishable, going through Shanghai, and it got stopped at the customs authorities. And um, they looked at the documentation and they said well, what is this cider, you know, that we think that you're importing fake wine and we don't want to let that into China. And, and the, you know, Zephyr's a tiny company. At the time, it had like 12 employees. And they were panicked because this, they couldn't afford to lose the consignment. They had distributors and users in Shanghai who were, the taps were going to run dry. They needed to get their product through really fast. And they were able to resolve this situation by having the phone number of the guy <laughs> at MPI who had a contact with, his, with someone in the customs um, in Shanghai, and he was able to say, no, don't worry, cider is legit, you know, um, and had the credibility and standing to do that, and that was partly institutional, you know, that MPI had those connections and that it could work inside China. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be very case by case, but um, I don't think there's any shortcut, probably. Yeah. Um, is there any other question from the audience? Well, I think we just have time for one more, and maybe I'll, if nobody else has a question, I'll just address a question mainly to Sarah and Peter. Um, sorry, Justine and Peter. Um, and the microphone, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it's become clear that um, from the discussion that success in trade is not simply a matter of trade policy. Our domestic policies in relevant areas matter a lot. And for example, we hear a lot these days about how um, overseas perception of our policies towards climate change and carbon emissions and our carbon footprint may increasingly affect the, our market access to a range of countries. And it was pretty clear from Peter's presentation that um, the policies around science and technology have a very important role to play in the impressive success that he outlined. I just thought I might ask both um, Justine and um, Peter, you know, given that we are in this current political status at the moment, um, are there any particular policy priorities and domestic policy that you would like to see in the future that, that would be particularly helpful for your efforts internationally? Thanks, Rob, for the question. I mean, I think you know, one of the things that we are seeing increasingly um, relevant in, in export markets, and I think we've heard this across a couple of speakers today, is the importance of um, businesses taking steps to address emissions. Um, and so, you know, we obviously have, there's a sort of a domestic political debate around agricultural emissions pricing, and, and we're part of that, the, the group through Hawaka Ekanoa who is looking at, at these issues. But when we look at the kind of the, the drivers and where the, the kind of the main pull is coming from, in fact, actually the louder voices in the room are really our global customers. Um, so we are seeing huge demand from some of our big global customers around the need to um, uh, adopt and implement uh, emission reduction targets. And we actually announced one around our on-farm emissions last week, which was a, a, a huge milestone for, for the co-op. Um, and I guess kind of while we're sort of seeing a lot of that pull kind of coming through from our customers, we also do see, um, you know, a lot of the kind of the regulatory development coming through in, in export markets as well, you know, particularly around things like carbon border adjustment mechanisms. Obviously at the moment, you know, none of the, the, the kind of the proposals on the table include agriculture, um, but, you know, we, we expect to sort of see that coming through um, 
through that in the future. So that's certainly, I think, you know, something that we are seeing coming through from sort of an export market perspective, and there will be a role for the New Zealand government in supporting uh, exporters through the, the development of the sort of appropriate re domestic regulatory settings, you know, whether that's around emissions pricing or, you know, provenance standards, um, you know, just in, in telling, I think, the New Zealand Inc. story, because, yes, I think we all recognise we've got a long way to go in terms of, you know, addressing a whole raft of sustainability uh, challenges and opportunities. Um, but, you know, we also have a really great story to tell in terms of the low existing low carbon position of a lot of the products that New Zealand, um, you know, sells to the world. So that's, that's the sort of the area that I would see as, as a key focus going forward. Um, yeah, I think um, science, technology, policy, uh, funding policy by the government is absolutely crucial for successful economic outcome in high-tech industries. I mean, a rather nice example I can give, I think, is that the MB Catalyst Fund, which does have a very strong international engagement flavour to it, um, and is acting essentially as a, as a pre-competitive, helps achieve the... The, the research helps fund the research to the point where investors can come in and and take over. And that, that valley of death is a real issue. And I think the government really is and needs to be absolutely cognizant of what it takes to get to the point where you can really get investor interest in the economic um, development of key research ideas. And that catalyst grant that MB runs is it funded a application for us at ABI called 12 Labours, which was really the reason we got our European grant. It was because we had been able to develop the core infrastructure that the Europeans then wanted to make use of for this much larger European initiative. And if it hadn't been for MB's foresight in, in that catalyst uh, area, we would not have got our European grant. Thank you. Um, maybe if, if I could just ask Joel if he'd like to have the last word. Is there any quick comment you'd like to make about um, any policy that um, a policy uh, um, initiative or any policy priority that you would like to see coming from New Zealand for uh, supporting the Pacific Islands priorities? Very much, um, perhaps one thing, uh, one enabling. <coughs> Uh, a factor that uh, has been discussed at the Forum Trade Ministers meeting has been in relation to just the uh, sort of enabling um, a contribution from uh, a digital technology, you know, just in terms of sort of supporting our e-commerce um, and other sort of forms of uh, trade as well. And it's uh, it's. Uh, widely recognised and understood as uh, something that can help to accelerate and boost um, civic trade. Um, forum trade ministers and economic ministers um, have really uh, targeted this as a, as a key area for sort of consideration uh, and it's probably just uh, something for um, participants to, to sort of think on and uh, uh, think about um, moving forward. So I'll probably leave it there. But thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to say um, on your behalf my thanks to the panel. Uh, it's been a fascinating panel for me. I've learned a lot and I'm sure um, most of you have learned a lot as well. So um, with warm thanks to um, our four panellists, um, I will invite you now to break for lunch. Thank you.